It's a lot of people to ask this question to. Do you want a good reputation? Well, let me ask you this. Maybe you don't want to answer. Do you have a good reputation? Okay, do you want a good reputation? How many of us would say yes by show of hands? We want a good reputation. We care about what people think, believe, perceive about us. Well, maybe you need help. There are a couple of websites that may be able to help clean up your reputation. Reputation Defender is one of them. And they say, don't like your online Google search? You ever searched your name? Don't do it now, OK? But they claim they can clean up your image online. They can remove the bad, and it will only show the good. Own a business, got a two-star review, but what you long for are only the fives. They'll remove the bad, and they'll only show what is good. There's a second uh, reputation repair company that claims they have been the most award-winning for the last 13 years. Maybe they can help you. Actually, they say they can take control of your reputation. They will remove all that's negative and only promote what is positive. Wouldn't that be good? If we could only promote what is positive in our life. Well, Jesus, he doesn't try to cover up our reputation when we don't reflect him as our Lord and Savior. He doesn't try to cover up. In fact, he calls out the church. If you would join me in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, and we're going to be in chapter 3 this morning, Revelation chapter 3. We're going to look at just six verses, one through six. And we've been in a series titled Letters to the Church. This is letter number five to church number five in an area called Asia Minor. Today, that would be modern-day Turkey. And so far, we've looked at the church at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, and this morning we're going to look at the church in Sardis. And the risen Lord, Jesus Christ, he had ascended into heaven and he's giving this vision to John the Apostle and having him record these words to the church. Seven churches, seven is a number in Revelation that means what? Church family. Full or complete. That means that he's not just writing to the church at Sardis, he's writing to all churchy, churches throughout human history until Jesus comes again, which means that the risen, ascended Lord is speaking to the people where? At Bright Christian Church this morning. So we want to have open ears and open hearts to be able to respond to the word of God. Listen to what he says, verse 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis write. The angel here, Agalos, could mean a celestial being, a created being that is a messenger of God, a literal angel. Or it was also used as a term that was used for a messenger in the church, leaders in the church. Here he's writing to leaders in the church at Sardis. It says, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. There's that number seven again. Seven spirits of God is a term for the Holy Spirit. Seven meaning full or complete. The Holy Spirit has full, complete power and authority over all creation. Amen? Amen. And the stars, the seven stars, refers to all leadership within the church. He holds authority over the leadership of the church. He says this, I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are what? You're dead. There it is. He doesn't try to just promote what is positive and remove the negative, does he? No, what Jesus does is he confronts a reputation that does not reflect him well. And what's behind that statement to the church at Sardis? You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead? There may have been many people in that church. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. There are likely 600 people in this service alone right now. That is not where we get our reputation, is it? How many people are in this church? You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. And think of what Jesus is saying in that city. We have to understand some of the history of that city. They're in the later first century. Sardis 
was a city just 30 miles south of Thyatira, and it tried to be as important as the first three cities that we studied, Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum. Remember, they were considered the first of Asia, the best, most beautiful cities in Asia Minor at the time. And Sardis was trying to keep up. Now, it was a beautiful city. They were built actually on a mountain. Old Sardis was built on the side of a mountain. And as the population grew and they uh, could not build there anymore, they built down in the valley. And they were financially wealthy. The economy there was so strong because of wool. They had a great clothing industry because of wool. And so they were known for their clothing market. And people wanted clothing from Sardis from all over the known world at the time. Not only were they known for their clothing, they were known for their military, military strength. In fact, they were considered an acropolis because of its location, made it a safe city because of its military, made it strong, but they had fortified walls that ran 850 feet high on three of the four sides of that city. They boasted that our military strength and the way that our city is structured with these large walls, we are impregnable. Nobody can overtake us. We talk about an arrogant attitude. Their economy was strong. Their military was strong. People wanted to live in this city. Not only that, there was cult worship. There were four primary cults in that city, including one of the cults that we studied last week, Apollo and the cult to Artemis or Diana. That false religion was booming, so much so that they wanted to compete with Ephesus. So they built a temple to that false goddess Diana or Artemis. But they never finished it. It was the same size or maybe a little bit bigger, but they never finished what they started. Jesus says, you have a reputation in that city of being alive, but you are dead. There's one more thing that stands out. They weren't just a necropolis. They were also considered a necropolis. Anyone know what a necropolis is? Ne necros in the Greek, the first part of that word, it means dead corpse, dead human body. Here's why. Because they were literally considered a cemetery city. They were called the city of a thousand hills. From seven miles away, that skyline, you could see in Sardis, the hills, the burial mounds. From seven miles away, people would have their loved ones brought in just to be buried in Sardis. And so Jesus uses this as an opportunity to say, you have a reputation for being alive? but you are spiritually dead. Just like those mounds that have all of those dead bodies, guess what? You are a church that is spiritually dead because you are so corrupt. You know, there are only two of the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 that Jesus confronts that are absolutely uninhabited today. And they're the two that he brings the strongest condemnation against. Sardis, and later, we're, in this series, we're going to study Laodicea. The church there is uninhabited. That should tell us that Jesus, he gave them time to repent, but they what? They never did. The church was so corrupt. And if you remember, when we first started this series, Jesus said there are seven lampstands. And the lampstand stands for the church. And the church should burn with a passion for Jesus Christ. Amen. We ought, to burn. we ought to have a flame burning for the Lord. And he says, when you don't do that, when you don't reflect me well, I will give you time. But if you don't repent, I will come and snuff out your lampstand. You will cease to be a church. You know, there are likely many churches in our culture today that have many people. But they are nothing more than social clubs. Because they re do not receive the Lord's rebuke and repent. And turn back to God. Look at what he says. He says, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. Wake up, present tense Greek. You strengthen what remains. In other words, he's checking the pulse of that church and he's saying what? There's a little bit of what? A pulse. There's still a pulse here. You wake up, you strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God. You made a commitment with, to me with your mouth. You call me Lord, but you have not completed that commitment by the way you what? Live. 
by the way you live your life. Your actions do not match up with your words. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, and hold fast to it. You hold it fast. What did they receive? What did they hear? Church family, what did they hear? The word of God. Jesus, he gave it to the apostles, and the apostles advanced the church. And the apostles now have passed on the word. And he says, look, you have received the truth, the word of the living God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast. Don't let it go. And you repent. That word repent is a compound word in the Greek. It's metanoia. It means to change the mind. Change the mind about the way you're living your life because it does not honor God. It does not honor the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to talk about a stern warning to the church. Anyone here want to have a reputation of being alive? Raise your hand if you want to have a reputation for being alive. I want to share with you five things that we received from the text. On the back of your bulletin, there's a place for you to take notes. I want to share with you what comes directly out of the text. In order to be alive in Christ, we must do five specific things. Number one, we have to wake up. We have to wake up in our culture. You see, that city, they said, we are impregnable. No one can take this city. We're so strong militarily. Look at how fortified our walls are. We're so safe. And you know what the city did? They became very complacent. And in the history of that city, they were right. They were never taken by battle. Do you know how they were taken? By stealth. Two times in their history, they were taken under the cover of darkness while the city slept, while they were asleep. The enemy was able to move in quietly and under stealth, they were able to take that city. They didn't even have to fight for it. You want to talk about being asleep. You know, there are so many people asleep spiritually today. And in, it, it, during the time that we're asleep, guess what's happening? The enemy is moving in to our marriages and our families. He's infiltrating and it's very easy while our kids and our grandkids are being babysat by the TV. The enemy is infiltrating our family. While we're asleep spiritually, and we say, someday I'll get my life together with Jesus after I'm done pursuing the things I want to do, after I'm done uh, pursuing the things I find pleasure in, one day I'll get my life together for Jesus. How long do you have? How long do I have? Anyone know? We don't know. Under the cover of darkness, the enemy is attacking marriages and families, gender and sexuality. And I want to really challenge us to wake up in our culture. Men, we're supposed to be the spiritual leaders of our family. You know, my first role is not lead pastor of Bright Christian Church. It's lead pastor of my marriage and my family. And the Number one primary role of every married man in here is to lead your wife and your children in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to wake up because the world is at work and the enemy is working to infiltrate our families. Men, do you want your families to be taken by the enemy? Do you want your kids to be struggling in the world today with how the enemy is trying to infiltrate with anything goes in our culture? Men, do you want your family to be taken? The answer would be what? No. And we got to wake up. Ladies, you've got to wake up in our culture. We can't sleep while the enemy is at work. We have to wake up. Number two, we have to watch. Comes directly out of the text. Present tense Greek. We have to take a stand against the enemy. How did Jesus stand against the enemy? What did he use when Satan tempted him after 40 days of fasting? What did he use to fight back? The Word of God. Do we know the Word of God here at Bright Christian Church? Guests that are with us today, we're so grateful you're here. Do you know the Word of God so that you can take a stand against the enemy morally in your life and in the lives of people who are in your sphere of influence? Can you guard your life and help others guard theirs spiritually? Or is your life open to everything and anything? 
that the world tempts you with. It's just a little bit, right? A little bit of sin. May God loves us too much for us to live like that. And Jesus died because he loves every one of us. But he didn't uh, die so that we could live however we want. He died so that we could live for him. We have to watch. Philippians 2.12 says this. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You ever heard that verse? Work out your salvation. Notice it doesn't say work for your salvation. See, there are churches, there are doctrinal backgrounds that will say, you can work for your salvation, you can earn your salvation. It's a lie. Jesus already gave us the gift of grace. It's up to us whether we accept that gift of favor and forgiveness from Jesus Christ. It's because of the work he did, not for the work we do. But work out your salvation is an interesting word in the Greek, work out. It means to bring to completion. In other words, allow your actions to match what your mouth is proclaiming. If you say Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you should be living like that. Perfectly? Absolutely not. But are we pursuing a life that reflects Jesus Christ? And the more that we spend time with Jesus, we look more like him than days and months and years past. We have to wake up, we have to watch, and then number three, we have to wash. We have to cleanse our lives from sinful, unholy living. Look what he says in verse four. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. I love this. Jesus, he always illustrates from their culture. And in their culture, I said they had a great what? Clothing industry. They were known for their wool. So it was easy to get clothing in Sardis. And if someone showed up at one of the cult pagan temples to worship with soiled clothes, filthy clothes, guess what would happen? They would be barred, banned from coming in to worship. Why? Because it's considered offensive to those deities. You know what the one true God says here? is that there are some who have not soiled their clothes. There are some that are working to be faithful to me. And by the way, it was easy in Sardis to be a Christian. You want to know why? Because the church was corrupt. It's easy to be a Christian when it doesn't cost you anything. But that's not true Christianity, is it? He says that there are a few in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. In other words, they're not trying to blend the world and blend all, everything else with Jesus. They're not trying to add anything to the word of God. They're not trying to add anything to faith. Just obedience in the word of God. And so their clothes are not soiled. And it is offensive to the one true God. When you and I show up with soiled clothes as a Christian and we just simply say, well, God, you'll accept everything I'm involved in. Hey, you just accept me where I am. I'm going to keep sinning. I'm going to keep pursuing a sinful life. Oh, but you're my Lord. Is that offensive to God, church? That's, that's playing games with God. It's offensive. And that's not true worship. In Acts chapter 2, when the apostle Peter, on the day of Pentecost, they received the Holy Spirit in power, and Peter preaches this. Very bold sermon. Have you read it? How many of you have read that sermon? Peter on the day of Pentecost. And some of the Jews that helped hang Jesus on the cross, they were there. And it says that at the preaching of Peter, they were cut to the heart. That cut to the heart means what? They were, they were convicted. Who, do, who convicts the world? The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. The Holy Spirit working on their heart. They felt guilty for what they had done. And because of that guilt, they asked Peter and the other disciples, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, we have to be in a position where we can understand conviction. We can understand sin. Sin is doing anything that's disobedient to God. Anything that disobeys God. That means we have to be at an age where we understand what sin is. We have to be able to believe what Jesus said in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through 
me. Jesus is the only way that we can be re reconciled to God. Amen? And we have to be at a place where we can believe for ourselves and repent, turn away from unholy living for ourselves. And then we have to be in a place in our lives where we can invite Jesus to be the Lord of our life. No one else can make that decision for us. Not as a baby, no one can make that decision for us as a teenager, as an adult. We all have a personal decision to make when we reach the age of accountability. And we have to not only repent, we have to confess, invite Jesus Christ to be Lord of our life, according to Romans 10, 9. That if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, we will be what? Saved. Paul goes on to talk in Romans about the importance of baptism. We have to make a personal decision to then be baptized into the Lord, to be buried with him in water. Romans 6, 4 says that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too can what? Live a new life, walk a new life. Man, that burial is so important. It's the point where our heart is regenerated. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit living in us. There are two ladies today who are going to be baptized. Lisa, over here to the far left, raise your hand. She's going to be baptized during this service. Linda, raise your hand. Linda's going to be baptized here in just a little bit. These two women came this week, and they've gone through the process of salvation, and there are women here that have been impacting them in different areas of ministry, and I got the pleasure of being able to sit and talk through the process of salvation with Lisa. And she said, I need to be baptized. I need to make that decision personally for myself. Isn't that what Scripture teaches us? We have to be washed. We have to be cleansed. We have to repent. James 4, 8, the brother of Jesus says this, Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. God doesn't just want us washing our hands like the Old Testament priest who symbolically washed themselves before going into the temple. He doesn't want to just cleanse our hands. He wants to cleanse what? Our hearts. He wants a changed life, transformed by the word of God. Here's number four. We have to walk. And if we're going to be alive with Christ, we must walk with him day after day. We must pursue spiritual growth in our own life. It's interesting what Jesus says here. Notice he says, they will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. White represents holy, pure, righteous. It's those who are forgiven, who have accepted the grace of God. They will live a victorious life. Look at what else he says. He says, I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. I will never blot that person's name out of the book of life. So interesting to think of the cities that we've studied, including Sardis. They had a registry of citizens for each city. And that citizen's name would be written in the registry of that city until they, until they died. And their name would be erased from that registry. And what does Jesus say? The one who is victorious... The one who surrenders their life to me. The one who finds life in me. They will walk victorious. They will be dressed in white. And their name will what? Never be blotted out of the book of life. We are citizens with God for eternity. And we get to live today walking with Jesus with a new perspective. We can live with an eternal purpose today, can't we? We can live with eternal purpose. Philippians 3.20, the Apostle Paul said this to the church at Philippi. He said, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He came, he gave his life for us, he was dead and buried. On the third day, he was raised again 
After 40 days of walking with his disciples, more than 500 witnesses saw him at one time. He ascended into heaven where he is at the right hand of God the Father in full authority over everything. And someday he is coming back again to take the believer home to be with him where he is. Man, for the believer, if we were to die today, the payoff is really good. It's really good. We get eternity with Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.27, the Apostle Paul says this, For all who have been baptized in Christ have been clothed with Christ. We walk with him. It's recognizable because our life is different. And people can see the impact that Jesus is having in our life. It's like the apostles in Acts chapter 4. It says they saw Peter and John and they realized they had been with who? With Jesus. Can people recognize that we've been with Jesus? We call him Lord. Can people recognize that we've been with Jesus? We've been in his word. We've been in prayer. He's transforming our lives for the better. Can people tell? Here's number five. We must witness. We must witness. Jesus says this. He says, but I will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. That's a, that's a court term. It's a legal term. It means I will stand and defend that person's name. What do we deserve because of our sin? Separation and death for eternity. What do we get? Life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You want to talk about a gift of love, a gift of grace, a gift of forgiveness. Isn't that the hope of Easter? Isn't that the message of hope? That's the message of hope. That we can have life through Jesus Christ. This witness, Jesus says this, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We've all heard the Word of God, but do we share the Word of God? In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus gave what is called the Great Commission. Do you know what it says? Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now you go. He's giving the church, every believer, authority to go in his name. Now you go, and it's present tense Greek. It's an action that should continue day after day in our lives. And you go means as you go about, as you go about your day, as you go about your work, whatever that is, as you go about school, young people, as you go about shopping in the grocery store, whatever it is that you're doing, as you go about, you make disciples of all nations. That word nations is the word ethnos in the Greek. It's where we receive the word ethnic. Church family, how many races did God create? How many races? One race with all kinds of diversity. And every week in that God created series. In the beginning, God created. We celebrated that there are differences in the world when it comes to color. Aren't we grateful that God made people different? And he made all of us. He loves all of us. And we make disciples. That's our calling, to take the word of God to all nations, all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. See, baptism is essential to the believer and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. And surely, Jesus says, I am with you to the end of the age. See, we have a great commission, and we have a great companion who will not leave us or forsake us. And I can't help right now to be up here and hear a baby, hear children in here. Aren't you grateful to be a church that has young people that's being raised up in the Lord, I'm so grateful for that. We should give God praise for that right now. There are young people learning about God in this church. It's going to change the course of their life. I've got to tell you, I didn't have a good reputation when I came to Christ. There was no website that could help me. There was no website that could repair the reputation I had made for myself. It was a very poor reputation. I was involved in all kinds of immorality. Many of you know my story. I'm ashamed to say this in front of my kids. 
But the reality is, God took me from the gutter, and he cleaned me up. And I'm a godly man trying to live for Jesus every day, not perfect, but pursuing Jesus. And never did I dream that I would be sharing the word of God with many, many people in my life. And I wouldn't change my life for for anything. I wouldn't trade my life for the world because it is so good. God has been so good to me to take me from the reputation I had and to repair a dead reputation. I had a reputation that I was dead and people knew it. And only Jesus can take a dead reputation and raise it from the dead and give it new life. That's what he did for me. I get the opportunity to share his word every day with people. I'm so grateful that Jesus raised my life from the dead. And I get to live with an eternal purpose and perspective every day. And someday I get to celebrate with Jesus in heaven. And the payoff is really good. And I look forward to it. I look forward to it. Do you? Do you have a reputation for being alive? But you're dead? You see, there are people in here. There are different types of people. There are people that claim that Jesus is their Lord. And they say that with their mouth, but you can't tell it with their life. Nothing's changed. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead? Man, that's not the way God wants your life to play out. Never surrendered your life to Jesus? You're just like, I don't care. I'm living the way I want to live. Someday I'll come to Christ. I used to think like that. You don't know how long you have. And if you died today, you really are dead because you are not alive spiritually. And then there are people that have surrendered their life And you know exactly what it's like to stand on the other side of the grave, don't you? And to know what eternal life and eternal perspective looks like. You want a reputation for being alive? You have to surrender your life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There are no loopholes. Only Jesus can give you a reputation that's truly alive. Would you pray with me? Father God, we are thankful for the message this Easter weekend. That God, to the church at Sardis, you were speaking to a church that needed to wake up. God, there are people here today that need to wake up. There are people here today that we need to stand. We need to watch, to stand watch of our lives spiritually and to not allow the world and sinful living to simply seep in and take control. God, we need to wash, we need to repent. And so for those who need to repent and come back to you today, Lord, I pray for a response that many people would renew their commitment to you today. And some, for the very first time, would surrender their lives to you and find true life, true meaning, true purpose in this life. Only you can give it, Jesus. Pray, God, that many people would walk with you in a much deeper relationship, that as we leave here, we would consider how much time we spend with you in your word, how we know you, how we long to live for you. And then, Lord, I pray that as we leave, that the many people that are in this room would not be able to shut up about you, Jesus, but in every area of their life, they would proclaim you as Lord to family, to friends, to people on the team, in our community, God. We would share the word of God so that people could be led to Christ and be saved. God, help us to share the life-saving message of Jesus Christ this week and in the month ahead. God, help us. Lord, we uh, thank you for the lives you've given us through Jesus Christ. And as we continue to sing and worship this morning, you are the God who is worthy of all of our praise. So, Lord, we worship you with open hearts and minds. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.